Over the past probably five or six years, I have gotten a lot of fruit in my own prayer from the responsorial psalms at Mass. And I could admit to you that it took me five out of my six years of seminary to realize why the responsorial psalm is called a responsorial psalm. And that shows you a lot about me because it's not that difficult. It's called a responsorial psalm because it's a response to the first reading. That changed my life. I've been praying with the responsorial psalm differently ever since I realized that. And so as I was praying with the scriptures this week to prepare for this homily, the responsorial psalm jumped out at me. And we prayed together that he who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. And so another little secret about myself is that if I don't know exactly how to define something, or I don't know exactly what I'm trying to get at, I will go to the computer and I'll type in St. Thomas Aquinas on blank. And so a few months ago, I was giving a talk, and so I went and I did this. And I was surprised to learn that St. Thomas puts the virtue of religion and prayer underneath the virtue of justice. I thought this was strange, because it seems like it would make more sense for prayer and religion to be put under faith. A person who is faithful is one who prays, one who carries out their religious practices. And so it seemed to me like that would make more sense. But the more I read into it, the more I sort of saw how he uh, decided on this, the more it made sense to me. And the reason that he puts justice under, or sorry, prayer under justice is because he says that justice is giving to a person what is their due, right? What they are owed. People deserve out of justice to have enough food to eat. And so it's not an act of charity if we give someone food that they need to live, but it's justice, right? They deserve it because they are a human being and they need that to live. And he says that justice perfects man in his relationship to others. Whereas the other virtues sort of focus on me and myself, the virtue of justice puts me in right relation to others. And then finally he says that religion perfects man in his relationship to God. And so it falls under that virtue of justice because it's a relationship to another, but the other is God. And so justice is giving each person what is his due, and religion relates us correctly to God. And so the virtue of justice, dealing with religion or dealing with God, Uh, means that we owe God something. There is something that is due to God because He is God. And so we should ask ourselves, right, what is it that we owe God? What is it just for us to give to God? If we look at the big picture, we say everything. Right? God created us. God endowed us with certain gifts, with certain talents and treasures. And so we owe everything to God because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Him. But more specifically with this virtue of religion, we owe God our worship. We owe God our praise. We owe God our thanksgiving. That is what is due to Him because He is God. And we hear this in the readings today. In the first reading, we heard about Abraham encountering these three men, and he sort of has a strange reaction, right? How often are we walking down the street, we see three men, and we're like, wait, stay right there, I'm going to get you some water and some cakes, and I'm going to take care of you. That's not that strange in South Louisiana, but it is a little odd. Until we realize that these three men in the Old Testament are a foreshadowing of the Trinity. And so Abraham is conversing with God. And so when he, real, when he encounters God, he realizes that he owes something. Right? He needs to serve these three men. And so he waits on them. He gives them what they deserve. 
And then again in the responsorial psalm, we prayed that he who does justice will live in the presence of the Lord. And we realize that this is true, and we live this out every time we celebrate the Mass. Because the Mass, right, is an act of thanksgiving, and so we're giving to God what is His due. But then also we show this in the prayer called the Preface. So right before the Eucharistic prayer, the consecration, we have the preface, and it begins with a dialogue. Right? The priest says, the Lord be with you, and you say, and with your spirit. And then lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. We say, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And your response is, it is right and just. It is right and it is just for us to give thanks to the Lord. Right? He is owed that because He is God. And so every time we celebrate the Eucharist, right, we give thanks to God, we worship God, we praise God, we give Him what is His due. So why should I harp on this? Maybe I shouldn't, is what you're thinking, but I should, right? So why am I harping on this? What is the sort of meaning for us as we come to Mass, right? That's sort of a great theology lesson, maybe. But what does it mean for us? Well, it means, and this is where it all comes from. The past several months, several years, really, I've been hearing a lot of people, particularly young people with families, particularly my friends who are, have young kids, they say, Father, I don't know why I go to Mass, because I feel like I don't get anything out of it. I have young kids, I'm constantly telling them to be quiet, I'm constantly telling them to pay attention, I'm constantly trying not to be embarrassed by what they do or say. I'm thinking about my own parents when I was a kid. Right? Why go to Mass? I feel like I don't get anything out of it. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. The first thing is I have to admit that I have it very easy. I'm reminded of this every time I go to my families with my brother and my sister and their young kids. And I love them to death. I enjoy being around them. But I also love getting in my car to come home by myself. It's quiet. I get to pray uninterrupted. Pretty much every night I get a full night's sleep. I can feel the eyes of young parents just looking at me, hating me. Right? So I realize that I have it easy. I'm not saying that you uh, are slacking or whatever, but uh, that I do have it easy. But I also want to tell you to keep bringing your kids to Mass. Through the difficulty, through feeling like you're getting nothing out of coming to Mass, through feeling like you never have a moment to pay attention because you're constantly worrying about your kids, keep bringing them. And this idea I've been thinking about for a while, and I recently listened to uh, the audiobook, The Library Book. It's about this woman writing about the Los Angeles Public Library. And towards the beginning of the book, she talks about how when she went to the library as a young adult, she was flooded with all of these memories of visiting the library when she was a young girl. Her mom would bring her, they would go check out books and read and do all these things. And so she had all of these memories that came back to her. It's like she was going home when she visited the library as a young adult. And I think the same applies to us in our faith life. That if we're brought to Mass on a regular basis as young people, even if we don't pay attention, even if we fight it, like I did, right? even if it's the thing you hate doing the most, I left the faith for a little while, didn't practice, But then when I came back, it was familiar. It's like I was coming home because my parents had drilled it in me that we go to Mass. Right? It wasn't always easy. I'm sure a lot of times they wanted to either stay at home or leave me at home by myself and go to Mass, right? But they knew it was important for me to be there. That they as my parents were the first teachers in the ways of the faith. And so they brought me even when it was difficult. And I'm sure a lot of times they felt like they were getting nothing out of it. They probably felt like they needed to go to confession after trying to deal with me. But they kept bringing me, right? They saw that it was important. And so keep bringing your kids. Keep showing them that it's important to come to Mass 
by your effort to get here each and every week. And then the third thing that maybe is the most important with this idea, how do we sort of avoid falling into this trap that, well, I don't get anything out of Mass, why even go? Because of what we talked about at the beginning, right, that coming to Mass, ultimately, this is important, it's not about you. It's not about me. When we come to Mass, it is primarily about God. Right? That He is our Creator, He is our Redeemer, deserves worship. He deserves to be praised. He deserves thanksgiving. And He's given us the Mass as the way to do that. So when we come to Mass, we are coming for God. Now God, right, always does things with us in mind. And so we receive when we come to Mass also. But that's not primarily why we come. Right? We come because we are giving to God what is His due. We are coming out of justice to Him. And so we come to give Him worship even when we feel like we aren't getting anything out of it. Now, the last thing I want to say is that uh, I've been thinking again a lot about Coach Robichaud, right? I mentioned him in my first homily because he had just passed away. And something that he said, uh, I heard him say it a few times, I think fits in well here. He was talking about uh, maybe particular players that were having a difficult time, who couldn't play, were injured or whatever. Or maybe even the team as a whole was going through a rough patch. And he told them that they had to work while they waited. Right, a, a player that's going through a tough patch can't just sit on the bench and say, all right, well, I can't hit the ball right now, so I'm just going to sit on the bench and, you know, in three weeks everything will be great and I'll be able to hit again. No. Right, he works on what he needs to work on. He works on his mechanics. He practices. He tries to get better. And then eventually he comes out of his slump or the team starts to win games. And again, I think the same applies for us in our faith. That there are going to be days, there are going to be weeks, there might even be months or years where we feel like we are in a slump. Where we're not getting anything out of Mass. Right? There are many days when I go to pray, and it's not the most exciting thing. Right? You probably think that I go to the chapel and I'm just floating, because right? I'm so pious and holy, and everything's wonderful. Most days when I pray, I'm there. Right? That's the most important thing I do. Sometimes that's all I do. But I know that it's bearing fruit in other ways. Right? I don't get these great consolations in prayer itself. But maybe later in the day I have a conversation with someone who asks me a question. And I'm able to give them some good advice. And I walk away and I say, how in the world did I answer that way? How did I know to say that? And the only answer is through prayer. That I spend time in prayer daily, and that because of that, God sustains me. Right? That because I give Him what is His due, because I am just towards Him, He showers all kinds of gifts on me. And so we stay faithful whenever it's difficult. Right? We pray rather than being productive like Martha was being, right? We give that one hour a week to God, and we trust that that is the better part, right? Sitting at the feet of Jesus. And if we do this, then we are being just, right? We are doing justice. And then we can live in the presence of the Lord.